putting robots in inhospitable environments where humans can't reach is a good first step to try and build that infrastructure and build that trust and learning how do we do things safely. Water covers 70% of our planet, so it's easy to think that it will always be plentiful. Fresh water, however, is increasingly rare, with only 1% of all water fresh and accessible. This figure is further stressed by the changing climate, pollution and rate of consumption. The UN now state that by 2025, two-thirds of the world's population may face water shortages, leading to the displacement of 700 million people and it's been predicted that the wars of the future could even be fought over this. So are we doing enough to conserve and protect our most precious resource? Lovely sunny day here in South Yorkshire. All in the middle of the road. What exactly did happen here? First of all, there was like a trickle coming up the side, down the side of the house. I was really concerned for people because from above you could see the road was going up and down. Then all of a sudden it cracked like the top of an Easter egg. And we were just in a river. It just looked like a river. Every day in the UK, over 3 billion litres of perfectly clean drinking water is being wasted due to leakages within the ageing pipe networks running beneath our roads and houses. This equates to 25% of the UK's daily water consumption and can be as high as 50% in some parts of the US and Europe. Nobody's really safe from this, are they? This could happen to anybody. It could happen anywhere. It's anything that helps early warning, because that's the problem. There was no early warning sign. Current procedures for checking and fixing these pipes involve digging up large sections of road at a huge cost and disruption to the taxpaying public, leaving water companies desperate to find what they're calling no-dig solutions. So I've come to Yorkshire in the UK to meet the scientists that might have a solution in the pipeline. ICAR is part of the University of Sheffield and a world-class facility for developing and testing intelligent pipe infrastructure. Historically, what's the problem with our pipes? I mean, in the UK, you're looking at a million kilometres of buried pipes, uh, and generally they just ran in a totally uncontrolled way. The system's now starting to degrade, so the pipes are getting rougher, they have defects in them now. There are more people now in the UK, uh, rainfall's more intense, so the systems are having to cope with sort of pressures on them that they were never really designed for. So we saw a burst water pipe yep. um, earlier in Sheffield. Is that the kind of thing that you're testing here? Yeah, so that would be, let's say, uh, like a water supply pipe. So it's on the other side, so these sort of black pipe here. So it's quite easy to see a great big burst because your pressure drops very quickly and you see it on the surface. But much more frequent are the very smaller background leaks and they are the ones that, as a water company, you would really want to be able to repair or be able to locate and then think about repairing. So what's the best way people are doing it these days? Background leakage, there isn't a way, to no, be honest. There isn't a way. No. So we've got the sewers here, yep. the clean water here. Yes. Further to these difficulties with the clean water pipes, a huge amount of waste and disruption comes from leaks and blockages within the sewage systems increasing water pollution alongside problems for public safety and the natural environment. So I understand that this is a huge problem. What's the solution? So in order to understand where the power damage or failure begins to develop, you need to have a lot of sensors. And we don't have it at present. So we need to send sensors down the pipe to listen what's going on and to see what's going on and combine this information so water companies can make decisions so where parts of the pipe are more likely to develop a failure. Professor Horoshenkov has been working with a team developing sensor technology that can identify pipe defects before the problem gets out of hand. And we have uh, sensors in here which are fiber optic cable sensing, oh, which are I very sensitive. I can see it taped to the outside. So we've got acoustic sensors, a whole line of them. Sensors like these to place inside the pipe and they travel with the flow. As this sensor technology for future infrastructure is being developed, the current challenge remains. How do we get it into the million kilometres of existing pipes? Hey, Dave, how are you doing? Hi, Dave. This is Yi Chen. Yi nice Chen, to nice to meet you. Dr. Yi Chen Yun is a researcher working with Professor Horoshenkov on developing mobile sensor technology. 
what work are you doing here? So I was using this robot, which contains the acoustic sensing system, which has a speaker and the microphone array, which can be very sensitive and robust towards noise. Yeah, it's making the sound, the chirp signal. And uh, this sound will record it by the microphone. So the speaker makes the sound, and when it hits the like blockage, or lateral connection, then it will reflect back and received by the microphone. When you did that, that, that mapped this room, did it? Uh, not, yeah, it's kind of, but because this room is more complicated, but in the pipe, the acoustic energy is sort of restricted within the pipe. So it may reflect by yeah. the pipe walls, but mm -hmm. also by the pipe ends. Okay, so can we see this in action? We could see this in action, for sure. All right, in he goes. Aha, uh -huh. you want to close these to get the right acoustic um, Yeah, exactly. Signal. So otherwise it will leak out. The audible sounds from these acoustic sensors can travel miles down these plastic pipes and hundreds of meters down the wider sewer pipes. And then here comes the result. Okay. So this pulse, you see, they have different meanings acoustically. So here, these are the blockages. Yeah. So when we move the robot slightly, then we, we could see like the echo position change a bit. And then the, all this information can be connected and uh, be used to mapping the whole pipe system. These underground networks can date back over a hundred years to Victorian times, meaning they're largely unmapped and difficult to locate, with many digs resulting in what's known as a dry hole. This technology will help towards the first task of working out where the pipes actually are. But these trucks can only move forward and backwards, yep. um, so it couldn't turn. These prototypes made from off-the-shelf components are serving well for the development of these sensors. But when it comes to actual deployment, something much more bespoke and independent is required. You know, autonomous robotic platforms with different types of sensors were the way forward. From this, an initiative known as Pipebots was born a first-of-its-kind project that has been set up in collaboration between four major UK universities to design and build miniature autonomous robots that can travel the underground pipe network and check for leaks and damage. The University of Leeds has one of the world's leading robotics departments. This is one of multiple robotics labs that we've got in this building. Uh, this particular one is uh, focused on artificial intelligence, decision-making, navigation, collaboration between robots, swarm intelligence. Andy works for the mechanical engineering side of the department, developing a range of robotic explorers. One of my lab's first projects we worked on was using robots to investigate the pyramids. So this guy here has been to the pyramids, and then what's this one here? This is a little magnetic inspection robot that was able to inspect gas pipes that were made out of ferrous materials. Then that sort of led to us being able to take part in pipe bots. So this is a small little inspection robot that's able to have different locomotion styles and then have different sensors in different positions. One of the first big challenges for this project is miniaturization. As some small sewer and drainage pipes can be as small as 100 millimeters. How do you get everything into such a small space weighing very little? But if it weighs too little, it's going to flip over. So you want the right balance, you want big wheels and you want the weight center to be at the bottom. If it's too heavy, it's going to take too much power. If it's too light, it's going to be unstable. The plan would be for these small robots to travel the network at night when there would be less waste and water flowing down the sewage systems. So first we have sort of standard wheels with a good sized diameter to be able to get over different objects. They might be able to cut through waste. As well as being an exercise in miniaturization, this early prototype allowed the team to begin experimenting with different locomotion styles in relation to what obstacles and conditions the robots may encounter in the pipes. Netta, what else have we got going on? So you've just seen the robot that can go in a straight line. And the challenge for us is getting a robot like that and then telling it, OK, now behave in a real pipe. I'm one of the postdocs working in the pipe pod. Uh, I'm working on autonomous control for the uh, uh, robot. Right, OK, can I have a little look? This one, yes. it's quite cute, isn't it, this one? Autonomous control is not new. For example, the, the Mars rover, it can uh, run in there autonomously for uh, many years now but the main challenge is uh, our robot is very small. It is here we call Joey. Okay. Small Joey robot. When I come to the T-junction, it will detect the T-junction and turn right. 
autonomy is a massive challenge, overground and underground. So you want absolutely no communication with humans. You need the robot to be able to control its own motion, to know where it is, to know what it's doing, to decide what the next task is. Netta's background is in biological systems. But what's that got to do with robotic automation? This is where I live. OK. Oh, you live in a wormery. I live in a wormery because I love worms. So this is a three-dimensional microscope. We put the worms inside here and we take movies of how they move. What exactly has this got to do with building and designing robots? These worms are just magical, right? So they are probably the best characterized animals on the planet. They're not as clever as you. They don't play chess, but they do everything they need to survive. And they do it with less than a thousand cells, which include exactly 302 brain cells. So you've got of the order of 100 billion. And they're so prevalent all around the planet which means that they have had a really successful strategy. So how do they work? We can study how they move, we can take the principles, and we can try and put them into robots and solve real-world problems. The fact that these nematode worms have only 302 brain cells has inspired Netta to believe that she can build robots with computational abilities to achieve this level of movement and autonomy. When they come to you with the PipeBots project, how does that relate to what we've just been talking about here? We want to build robots that move in pipes and can inspect and say, this is broken, this is not broken, there's a leak here, there isn't a leak here. So what we're learning from these shots is how these animals are trading off their forward speed with their need to sample their environment. And that's exactly what we need robots to do. What Netta and her team have learnt from these worms will inspire the next stage of autonomous development, using what's known as active sensing to gather information, diagnose and make decisions in real time without any need for human processing. But for now, we head back to Sheffield to see the current progress being tested alongside the sensor integration. So what are the key components to this robot? The key thing is the camera in the front. Uh, it's a wide angle lens camera. There's also LiDAR sensors on here, or range sensors that we use to actually keep it in the centre of the pipe and detect whether there's anything in front of it. An inertial measurement unit, which we use to see how far it's been. And there's also encoders on the wheels. It sends a number of pulses per revolution. And from that, we can work out how long a pipe is or how far it's travelled down that pipe. It would be filming as it's going, taking pictures of where it's been, and then it'll explore to the end of the pipe and then come back again. And what is this proving to us? It basically proves that it can drive itself. It doesn't need an operator to actually drive and control it. If we had a bigger pipe network here today, we could actually watch it drive all the way around the pipe network on its own. There he goes, off it. <laughs> pipe lots. You need a theme tune. Have you got a theme tune? <laughs> Current methods for sewer inspection includes using tethered robots that can only travel in a straight line from manhole to manhole. So while it's still very early days, we can begin to appreciate the progress that's been made by the PipeBots team. There you go. He made his way back to base. So. Yep, and he's come back with some data. He's come back with some data, yeah. There is actually a slot for an SD card in the back of there. Okay. As I say, these particular small ones were really only there to see what size we could get down to. Building on the limited sensors in Miniature Joey, this oversized prototype, known as TankBot, is carrying a few extra tools that will tell us much more about the condition of the pipes. This one's got the ultrasonic sensors on it as well, and the acoustic sensors. In addition to the acoustic sensors, as demonstrated by Yi Chin earlier, the ultrasonic sensors in this robot emit an inaudible ultrasonic frequency of over 20 kilohertz, the same as cars use in their parking sensors. This signal only travels a much shorter range, but can produce a significantly clearer picture of the pipe's defects. So eventually the key will be to optimise whatever we've put on there and then shrink it down to a robot of this kind of scale. I see. Finally, this one looks like it's a bit more finished. Or It is, yeah. We're quite excited about this one because it's the first time we're trying it in the pipe today. It's kind of hot off the press, if you like. We've just made it, so at the moment we can only operate it by remote control. Eventually it will be waterproof. As we move to water pipes and away from the sewers, uh, we'll know how to actually make something that can live there for a long time without failing. Into the more clean water pressurized pipes? Yes, eventually. Okay. We're very interested to see how it uh, 
the herbs in the pie. Well, there's only one way to find out. <laughs> can I put it in? Of course or... you can, yeah. Go right, ahead. okay then. The first stage for these robots will be inspecting the larger sewage pipes, but as the technology advances, it is intended this will soon progress to the pressurised clean water systems. It's doing really well. Those wheels are working better than we thought. It's actually behaving much better than we hoped, to be honest. It's clearly early days for this project, but with breakthroughs in sensor, miniaturisation and autonomous technologies, we can consider this a significant start on what is set to be a 10 to 20 year journey. Why is this important? Water is essential for our well-being. I think we take uh, provision of clean water for all for granted. So we don't appreciate it very much because we know it's going to be there. So, but unless we do something about it actually now, so it may not be there all the time. The PipeBots team envision a swarm of robots that will work together to inspect and map the pipe networks swimming like fish within the flow of fresh water pipes and even execute maintenance and repair tasks. 20 years ago, this may have sounded like science fiction, but increasingly we see robots and AI technologies transform all aspects of our lives and futures. Putting robots in inhospitable environments where humans can't reach is a good first step to try and build that infrastructure and build that trust and learning how do we do things safely. And then one day, hopefully, we can have these robots overground, finding solutions, helping us be more sustainable. It's probably important in the future as well for not just the pipes, but also in other like environments. The robots, they are trying to like, imp improve lives of human beings.